Good evening and a big welcome here to an extremely special edition of 5 by 15. Tonight we're going to be talking about journalism, about stories of pioneering investigations, about government cover-ups and about dark money. So, spoiler alert, I've been a journalist all my life, but when I began, we used to type out the articles onto photosynthesis, photosynthetic paper. If we'd made a spelling mistake, we'd have to retype the word, cut it out with a scalpel, stick it back onto the right place, you hoped, with a bit of glue. If we needed to know something, we went to the library, we took the tube up to North London to the newspaper library in Collingdale, or we used the telephone, and quite often you just used the telephone directory. It seemed that it was jolly easy for people to hide information. So when the internet arrived, I, like many people, thought, it'll be really hard for people to hide, we're gonna know everything, it's going to make the life of the journalist much easier. It was a bit of a miracle to start with. It seemed very simple as well that you could find out so much from your screen. But of course, it wasn't that simple. And politicians and corporations and all the things we want to know about, they found new ways to hide. And on top of that, lots of conspiracy theories have flourished. Truth has in fact become very, very difficult to find in this world of masses and masses of information. So I'm delighted tonight because these are really big questions for all of us and they're really big questions to me. I mean, that we've got three of the world's most expert people on trying to resolve these tricky stories. One, Amelia works in a com more conventional newspaper, one that I certainly much more understand. And two, Elliot and Peter are working in online news organizations, but they all have something in common. They're storytellers, they're journalists, they're investigators, and they have told stories that people in power would really rather that they didn't. Format tonight's really simple. All three of them will speak for about 10 minutes each. Then we'll have a bit of chat between us. And then please, it's over to you all at home. And I can see that there's loads of you signed up tonight. Do put your questions into the Q&A box and I promise we'll get to as many as we can. All three have great books out. You can see them behind me and I'll bring them forward when I introduce them. I've read all three in the last few weeks and I have to say, truth is better than fiction. These are terrific books, they're great reads, but more than that, they're seriously important. I'm gonna introduce each speaker as we get to them. And I'm delighted that our first speaker tonight is Amelia Gentleman, who is a Guardian journalist and the author of The Windrush Betrayal, which I have here. This is an extraordinary book that's based on Amelia's amazing and pioneering and dogged work at The Guardian. She was well-deservedly shortlisted for the Orwell Prize, and in fact, her journalism also won the Paul Foot Award. Now, this isn't just a good read. It is a good read. It's also horrific. It's extremely shaming. I put it down and thought, bloody hell, I live in this country, and this has been going on on my watch, and that's quite a tough feeling. As you listen to her, remember this, if it wasn't for Amelia, the people who have been so disgracefully treated by the Home Office, the Windrush generation, as we call them, might still be going through exactly the same thing. They'd have vanished under the radar. Too awful to contemplate. So please, I wish I could join our hands together, but I join my hands together. Welcome, Amelia Gentleman. Thank you. Thank you for that um, kind introduction. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here talking about this um, because this is a um, scandal which uh, remains unresolved and a scandal that we should still be um, thinking about. Um, it's probably the most uh, disturbing issue that I've worked on as a journalist. And also, I think the most shocking example um, that I've ever encountered of a government willfully pursuing a harsh policy um, whilst ignoring the really catastrophic impact that that policy was having on people's lives. Uh, it's been three years now since the government first apologized for the debacle. And since then, um, we've had profuse apologies from three consecutive home secretaries um, and commitments to reform from two prime ministers, promises that they want to do right uh, by the Windrush generation. But many of the people affected are still waiting for justice. Uh, they're still in debt. They're still facing eviction letters as a direct uh, consequence of home office mistakes. 
the government uh, displayed a really unforgivable slowness to act once the scandal was exposed in 2018 and is showing still an ongoing and, and quite incomprehensible slowness to put things right. Um, so just to remind you, the Windrush scandal was a Home Office orchestrated disaster whereby thousands of people who had been living in the UK uh, for decades, entirely legally, were mistakenly designated as illegal immigrants with really catastrophic consequences. Uh, some people were sacked from their jobs, um, others were denied NHS healthcare, some people were made homeless, um, other people were arrested and held in immigration detention centres, other people were removed to countries that they hadn't lived in since they were children up to half a century earlier. Um, this was something that kind of fell on my um, radar in about 20, at the beginning, end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And one of the first people um, who I interviewed then was a man called Renford McIntyre, who um, is here. Um, Renford was about 64 when I met him um, in early 2018. Um, I find this slide really upsetting, um, but I show it because it illustrates really clearly how badly people were affected by the Home Office mistake. So Renford was somebody who'd arrived in Britain as a child in the 1960s. He'd gone to school here, had worked here for decades, paid taxes for decades, and was working for the NHS as a driver when in 2014, um, the government increased the uh, immigration checks that employers were required to do. He was unable to show um, decisively that he had the right to live in the UK. And as a result of this, he was sacked by um, the um, hospital that he was working for, and he was consequently unable to pay rent. He became homeless. He had to live um, in a um, abandoned industrial unit in a place with no heating or running water. Um, when I interviewed him, he was puzzled by what had happened to him, but also absolutely uh, furious. Around the same time, I met um, Paulette Wilson, who'd also um, come to Britain in the 1960s as a child. Um, she'd been born in Jamaica, but came here entirely legally, um, went to primary school here, secondary school, had a daughter, had a granddaughter, worked in the House of Commons for a while. And in 2017, she received a letter from the Home Office telling her that she was here illegally um, and needed to leave the country. She was arrested twice. She was taken to immigration um, detention and she was booked on a flight back to Jamaica. Um, at, at the time when I, when I was um, reporting on those stories, it wasn't at all clear what had gone wrong. But it was really puzzling um, that the Home Office was sending out letters telling people um, that they had no legal right to live in the UK, even though the individuals who were receiving those letters knew that they were here legally and knew um, that a, a mistake had been made. But, but somehow um, there was no persuading Home Office officials um, that you know, that there, that there was a kind of bureaucratic disaster and individual after individual was taken into immigration detention and people um, were being threatened with removal and some people were in fact removed. Um, this is the um, document that Anthony Bryan had to carry around with him. Anthony was somebody again who arrived in Britain in the 1960s as a, as a young child um, worked here all his life, brought his family up and was told again in 2016 that he was an illegal immigrant. And he was held in immigration detention for five weeks um, without really anyone being able to explain to him why it was that he was being treated so um, harshly, even though he'd kind of committed no um, offense. Once we began to publish these stories in The Guardian, I began to get a kind of um, a series of phone calls and emails from other people who were similarly affected. Some of them um, had been arrested, 
others had um, been sacked from their jobs. And it, it's kind of hard to, um, it, it's hard to stress how badly people were affected. Um, the, these are just some of the many, many people whose um, really difficult situations we featured in The Guardian, but there are amongst them, there's ambulance drivers who were sacked from their jobs, special needs um, teaching assistants who were sacked from their jobs, people who were forced to go back to countries that they'd left as four-year-olds um, around 60 years later because they were so terrified by um, the government's, um, by the Home Office's kind of persecution of them. I think um, what's quite interesting um, for me talking um, with, with the other journalists here is how um, old fashioned in a way the, this exercise was as a journalistic exercise. Um, it involved me taking trains to, um, you know, to uh, different parts of the country, sitting down with people, going through their immigration paperwork. I felt for a long time like I'd almost become an immigration caseworker. But there was nothing kind of particularly, um, I, you know, clever that I found out about this um, disaster from the internet. There was no kind of special tricks about it. It was very much old fashioned shoe leather journalist journalism of, of pacing around and spending a long time um, talking to people. Um, it was quite a frustrating thing to report on because it took a really, really long time to get any political um, response from the government. For the first months of, of reporting it, uh, the Home Office tried to pretend that this wasn't an issue that was particularly important. It wasn't an issue that was affecting very many people, but it was really only through the kind of consistent, repeated reporting on disastrous situation after disastrous situation that we finally managed to um, force the government to apologize. Um, and, and you can see from these front pages that we, um, we put the story on the front page um, in April of 2018, every day for a fortnight. Um, and at the beginning of the fortnight, the, the government kind of apologized and, and said that the policy would be changed and that um, they were very sorry that a mistake had been made, but the apologies were fairly muted. By the end of the, um, by the, end of the, the fortnight, um, the then Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, had been forced to resign and there was beginning to be a real understanding that um, something really had to change. Um, this, as I say, was uh, three years ago. I want to be very upbeat about um, the kind of the power of journalism to force change, because I think that this was a really, really kind of optimistic example of getting, um, of, of holding the government to account and showing um, how badly things were going wrong. And The Guardian was kind of the perfect medium for doing it because we were able to grab lots of people's attention and there was a kind of a snowballing effect of more and more people coming forward as they saw um, our coverage online particularly, but, but also in print. So I do feel really kind of positive about what's been achieved um, as a result of this. Um, 13,000 people have been given um, paperwork proving that they are in fact not illegal immigrants. Um, a lot of people have got their jobs back Many people were flown at the government's expense back from exile um, in the countries to which they've been deported. Uh, however, um, it is an ongoing issue. Um, I spoke to Renford McIntyre this week um, and his situation remains really, really dire. Um, he hasn't had compensation yet, although it's been promised um, and the whole um, slow movement towards compensation is almost a, a second scandal. This is um, a picture of, of Paulette Wilson on the right hand side who I last saw in June when she and other victims went to Downing Street to call on the government to kind of pay the compensation that they promised and to implement all of the reforms to the Home Office that they promised. 
Unfortunately, um, Paulette died in um, the autumn before receiving the full amount of compensation. And the um, reforms, the kind of promise of a compassionate immigration system and a reformed home office that we've had promised on multiple occasions uh, still hasn't happened. So um, I suppose my kind of optimism is muted, but it does make me think that this is an ongoing issue and an issue that we have to continue to highlight in um, journalism, with journalism. You're on mute. You're on mute. I know. Amelia, thank you so much. That was um, that was absolutely fantastic. And gosh, that is that's quite a tough end, though, that we're not there. And so we have to keep going. But congratulations for all that you have done. Um, our next speaker is Peter Gagan, who's been with us before at 5 by 15. Um, and he's a wonderful speaker. His fantastic book is called Democracy for Sale, just now out in paperback. And it includes an incredible last chapter, new chapter, which is looking at what's happened during COVID and the incredible business of the contracts that have been awarded, what you could call COVID cronyism, where the money's gone. Peter's book is about uh, dark money, um, where money goes when it's sifted away by governments, the money that doesn't end up paying for the NHS, doing all the things that our taxes and that our public money is meant to do, and it ends up in the wrong places. Um, he works as the invest head of investigations for Open Democracy, which is a tremendous website where you can find all sorts of things. I couldn't recommend it too highly. And it has won many, many awards for its research. And again, like Amelia's stuff, this is all stuff that the government would like to keep buried. Um, so over to Peter and thank you very much. And as I say, don't forget both Amelia and Peter's book are in paperbacks and Elliot's got a great book too, it's in hardback. We'll come to it in a minute. Peter. Thank you very much, Rosie, for a very kind introduction and Amelia, that was a fantastic presentation. So I think I'm gonna start by breaking a little bit of news, which probably won't be news to many people. It won't be news to anyone on the panel, which is that actually journalism is a bit of a slog. As Amelia was talking about, there's lots of train travel and investigative journalism all the more so. You know, might watch Hollywood movies like All the President's Men or The Post, and you could believe it's lots of clandestine meetings in car parks and shouting, hold the press, at, like orderlies. But it's not really like that, at least not in my experience. And my favourite journalism movie is Spotlight, which I'm sure some of you remember, the, the Oscar-winning story of the, gold, the, of the Boston Globe's investigation into clerical child abuse um, from the 80s kind of onwards. And I like Spotlight particularly because it reminds me a lot of what I do most days. It's slow, it's a bit of a grind, just kind of hours and hours of sifting through documents. And eventually, sometimes, not all, all the time, you have a bit of a eureka moment. You find something and you go, this is really interesting. And I kind of often think that the only journalistic skill I really have is serendipity, if, if that's really a skill at all. And I kind of think you can never underestimate as a journalist or probably in life, the importance of kind of fortuitously asking the right question at the right time, or sometimes just being in the right place at the right time. And my book actually started off, if you read my book, it begins on um, an unlikely scenario of a Seaburn metro station, which is a station in suburban Sunderland on the outskirts of the island in the northeast of England. And it started off two days before the Brexit referendum. And I was working for the Irish Times at the time. And my editor there did that thing that editors often do before a big vote. They send you off to a town kind of far away from them to ask what's going on. And as I was leaving Sunderland, uh, I was just getting ready to find my copy, getting the train back to Scotland. I picked up a copy of the Metro newspaper and there was a wraparound advert in the front of the Metro newspaper with a big slogan that said, take back control, which was the official leave campaign slogan. And it had a big logo on the back, the logo of the Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP. And I thought that's very funny. And I kind of stuck it in my bag and I kind of thought oh, that's quite strange. And I used to work in Belfast as a journalist. So I knew that political donations in Northern Ireland were kept secret due to a loophole dating back to the Troubles. You know, you couldn't discuss political donations. You could actually get six months in prison for divulging any information about a political donation. And so that's, you know, I kind of basically from that train, standing on that train platform, it snowballed, it ends up into a large investigation that Open, Open Democracy, I've worked at Open Democracy on, and in many ways I've been investigating 
money and influence in British politics ever since. I've been doing other things too, but you know, I, I wrote that book, and we're, you know, remarkably, I actually still don't know where the DUP's Brexit money came from. So if you're watching this and you know, please get in touch. But it was one of those serendipitous moments that started off a kind of chain of events. I think a lot of journalists feel that experience. And so much of the last year, as Rosie mentioned, I've spent investigating kind of various aspects around Britain's response to the COVID pandemic. And I've been particularly looking at the issue of contracts, public contracts given to private firms. And I'm sure even lots of people have heard about this. Last week, a court ruled that Health Secretary Matt Hancock had acted unlawfully by failing to publish COVID contracts in what was called a timely manner. And actually, a few hours after that ruling, a friend of mine who works at TV reporting texted me he was asking if I felt like one of those music fans when a tiny band that you've been following for years gets really big overnight. And I'm not sure if that's quite the same thing. I, I don't think I feel like the time when Bright Eyes got to number one. And I was like, oh God, that's amazing. I've been following that for years. But it did make me think about like kind of how I started investigating this cold contracting story and, and in some ways the role of serendipity in journalism. Um, and I started looking at these kind of contracts in around April of last year. And I'd actually found myself back in Ireland. Um, since the pandemic started, I went back to try and get my mum settled and I found myself staying there. And, you know, like a lot of journalists, you know, this big, huge public health story had started. And as an investigative journalist, you know, I wasn't really too sure of what my role in that was. And I didn't wake up and think, you know what, like I'm gonna start looking at political donors and government contracts. Actually, I was just kind of interested in what was happening around the government's role, the government's kind of big scheme to kind of get um, PPE, personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. And I was talking to a clothing manufacturer in the north of England, and they wanted to produce medical gowns for frontline healthcare workers. Um, and, you know, there was a kind of big push that was going on at that time. And there's a call out for everybody. And this clothing manufacturer wanted to help genuinely. And he got in touch with the government, or at least he was trying to. And he emailed this address that was sent out for prospective PP suppliers. It was circulated by the cabinet office, but nobody was returning his emails. So I kind of we got in touch and we got chatting. And when I looked into it, I noticed that instead of the civil service running this operation, it was been run by Deloitte, the accountancy firm. And I kind of wondered, like, why is a you know private consultancy running this big important aspect of you know our kind of pandemic response? I kind of also want to know how much you've been paid because I'm nosy like that. And one of the nice things of my job is like, I can be very nosy. So I started off by trying to understand how the whole contracting system worked. And it wasn't something I was very familiar with. So I spoke to lots of experts who kind of walked me through how the system worked. And they've kind of been sounding boards for me ever since really. So I taught myself how to use as a government contracts finder website. Although it wasn't that much use because I found out that Deloitte's cabinet office contract hadn't been published and neither had lots of other ones. And over the months that followed, I kind of wrote dozens and dozens of stories about COVID contracting. And the thing that struck me most, and the thing I've always come back to more and more, is that I noticed that like in Britain, when we have a difficult situation, many people in power, their first response is to call on contracts and contacts that they have with the corporate world. So in less than six months from the start of the pandemic, the government handed out COVID-19 consultancy contracts worth around hundred million pounds. So Deloitte, the company that went to work, uh, they set up a unit uh, for PPE in the cabinet office. They also hired like a thousand consultants to work on track and trace. This included 40 consultants from back Boston Consulting, some of whom were paid as much as 6,000 pounds or more a day. And Deloitte was also selling testing services to local health officials in England at a time when there was a shortage of testing. It's probably worth mentioning as well that Deloitte, um, the cabinet minister, office minister, Chloe Smith, was a Deloitte consultant before she became a politician. You know, there's all these kind of connections into power. And I don't mean to just pick on Deloitte. Like, I'm not, I'm not here on some sort of anti-Deloitte rant. What really, I kind of what struck me really was once I started looking at Deloitte and other contracts like it was that lots of the jobs that you would think that the public sector would do in a pandemic were being outsourced. And they were being outsourced primarily, or not primarily, on, on a lot of cases, to companies that had lots of political contacts and had lots of individuals who had really good connections to politics. Um, like just today, Circle has announced that it's going to restore its dividend. So Circle is a big outsourcer. It's restoring its dividend for the first time in seven years. And the main reason it's doing this, and it has said this, is because profits are up on the back of pandemic contracts they got from government. Circle was given hundreds of millions of pounds to run the track and trace system. 
And the thing is that Circle wasn't even really running it itself. It subcontracted this work out to more than 30 firms, most of whom were kind of doing things like fielding phone calls. And because Circle is a private company, we don't, it's not subject to FOI. So we can't actually find out even who these firms that were doing this for, uh, work were. I did speak to quite a number of people who were involved in this work, this kind of contract tracing. Some of them were working for a travel agency and they'd been furloughed and then were put on to dealing with these calls. And the situation for these people was really difficult. They were sitting at, in, at home, often in places like the north of England, trying to field phone, call, phone calls from people who got kind of medical emergencies and they weren't able to deal with it. And it was you know, really, really difficult for them. And so why does any of this matter? And I guess like that's one of the things I often think when I'm doing this work is like, you know, and the, well, for one thing, contact tracing in this instance, can we know plays a key role in suppressing COVID-19. And we know that Britain's track and trace system kind of constantly failed to meet its targets. And we also know that Circo is very well connected politically. The company CEO was a grandson of Winston Churchill. One of the junior health ministers in his government is a former Circo lobbyist. Again, you can see a lot of political connections. Indeed, the more I found, the more you look at the intersection of business and government in Britain, the more you start to see the same players and often even just the same individuals recurring again and again in different guises. And you know, this is what we kind of refer to when we talk about the revolving door between business and politics. And this is in many ways, you know, we, we really do know this now. Like in November, the government spending watchdog, what's called the National Audit Office, issued what is a really damning report, for, especially for like, what is it, you know, an official body into COVID uh, contracting. And it found the PPE suppliers with political ties were given what they called high priority status. And they were put in a VIP lane. And companies in this VIP lane were 10 times more likely to be given government contracts than companies that weren't in it. And the sums involved in this were genuinely life-changing. You know, if you think about it, like we had a long running saga a few months ago during the summer between Boris Johnson and Andy Burnham, the mayor of Manchester, over how much to give Manchester extra for over the pandemic. And it was basically over five million pounds. Burnham settled on 65 million, Johnson said it'd be 60. Compare that to some of the sums that have been given out to people uh, for COVID contracts. It's like a business that was co-owned by a conservative donor, which supplied beauty products to high street chains, was given a 65 million pound contract to provide face masks to the NHS. A conservative councillor in Stroud in the Cotswolds, who ran a small loss-making firm, was given contracts worth more than 270 million pounds, to, again, to supply PPE. PPE. Another company called Ianda Capital, which was a kind of a, a family investment firm, was given over 250 million pounds in contracts to provide face masks, millions and millions of which were never used because of its design flaws. So you could, and this list goes on, we could have an entire five by 15 where you just read these things out. I'm not going to do that, I promise. But just to give you a bit more about how you journalistically kind of how these stories kind of start to cascade, one day last summer, I was doing what I often do, which is a trawling through transparency releases from the government. And this was on the internet. And I noticed that a small PR firm called Public First was working on COVID research for the cabinet office because you could see its spending. And Public First is run by two long-standing colleagues of Dominic Cummings and Michael Gove. Um, and it'd been given contracts worth more than a million pounds in total without any competitive tender last year. So on the back of this story, which I actually wrote with The Guardian with David Conn there, a court case into this award to Public First was launched by a campaign group called The Good Law Project. And that case is still ongoing. So we don't really, you know, we're going to find out hopefully the specifics of that in the coming months. But, you know, there's, a, there's been a lot of cases like this. And I think it's really easy to see the pandemic as an aberration. Um, but I th think it's more than that. Um, I think COVID has kind of revealed adept of cronyism and clientelism in British public life. And I think it's something that for some reason, Britain seems to generally be quite um, kind of wary and struggles to accept. You know, like if you think of the words we've been using at times to describe this, a chumocracy, jobs for the boys, they kind of feel very infantilizing and diminutive. And I think if these things were happening in another country, I think we would talk about them very differently. I think we would use words like clientelism and corruption. You know, if you look at the case of Robert Jenrick, the government minister, who hasn't resigned, even though he admitted apparent bias in overturning a planning decision in favour of a Conservative donor in London, which saved the donor, uh, Richard Desmond, an estimated 45 to 50 million pounds. Mr. Desmond had sat next to Mr. Jenrick at a Conservative Party fundraiser just a few weeks previously, in which the property developer had shown videos of said development to the government minister. 
when another government minister, Naheem Zahawi, was asked about this in today's program, he kind of batted away and said, why don't you just, you know, if anybody wants to talk to a minister, they too can go to Conservative Party fundraisers. And we know that like for £50,000 a year, you join a thing called the Conservative Leaders Group, where you get to go and have quarterly meetings with the Prime Minister and government minister, other government ministers that aren't minished. We don't know who attends. This is huge opportunities to buy access to the highest kind of echelons of British politics and buy it very cheaply. And in many ways, I think like it's kind of none of this is, is all that new. We've known about this revolving door. We know that politicians, you know, can go on to earn far more money outside of office than they'd earn inside of office. You know, the Chancellor, well, the former Chancellor, Shadiv David, last year left number uh, 11 Downing Street in February. By August, he was being employed by one of the big merchant banks. Um, you know, more money, or at least as much money as he, earn, he earns in government or earns as an MP. Theresa May has, earns infinitely more now, or not infinitely more, but significantly more now as a former prime minister giving speeches than she did in government. I think this really does her trust in politics. I think it's a really important yeah. thing. But it's worth, I kind of wanted to kind of just touch back before, before I close, like kind of looking back to 25 years ago, it's 1994, when John Major's back to basics conservative government was dogged by lots of sleaze scandals. And the Prime Minister announced he's going to establish a Commission on Standards and Public Life. And out of that came what was called the Nolan Principles, these kind of principles of honesty, openness and integrity. And I guess the question is, where are they now? You know, if you look in November, Lord Evans, yeah. who is now the Chair of the Standards, gave a speech saying we're now living in a post-Nolan age. And so, you know, I guess the end question is, if we are in a post-Nolan age, what are we going to do about it? Can we bring trust and integrity back to public life? Well, that's a really, really good question. Um, and it's a very good question to end on. And I, I think that I, well, personally, I feel a little bit gloomy about the answer to that right now. But Peter, thank you. Thank you so much. That was just completely riveting. It is a terrible, terrible catalogue of uh, cronyism. And uh, you're right, we call it jobs for the boys, but it will make it sound all jolly. Now, our last speaker tonight um, is the wonderful Elliot Higgins, who is the founder of Bellingcat, and he's the author of this fantastic book called we are Bellingcat, which you can see here. And the first investigation that Bellingcat did was to find out who had shot down the Malaysian Airways flight that was shot down over the Ukraine. And they did it by piecing together the info that you can find on social media, on different things online, just by painstaking. I mean, Amelia and Peter have both said the word, it's a lot of slog being an investigative journalist. And this was slog of a slightly different kind, but my God, it was slog because you get a real sense of how much went into it. Um, you've also tracked the Salisbury poisoners when our official channel seemed to have given up. And you have obviously been hugely influential in working out what happened to Navalny, who I gather is a friend of yours. Open source journalism, which is what it's called, has really come of age with um, Elliot's work. And I'm so pleased that you're here with us tonight. So over to you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. So um, I'm Elliot Higgins. I'm the founder of Bellingcat. But before I founded Bellingcat, um, I was a blogger. And that work included, um, basically, it came from uh, my need to basically argue with people on the internet and win those arguments. I was someone who spent too much time online. I was getting annoyed about the t whatever people were saying. But I kind of asked the question of myself, well, if I'm going to have an argument with people, can I do it using facts and evidence? Um, I discovered when you know, debating what was happening in the conflict in Libya, that there were these videos being shared from the conflict. And people would often say, well, how do you know where something was filmed? Um, well, I figured out how to do that. I used satellite imagery and other reference material to compare it to what was in the videos and um, show exactly where they were filmed. And that was my first taste of what we now call open source investigation. But back then it was just kind of looking at satellite imagery and comparing it. It wasn't really a field of investigation. But over the years, I kind of developed this field and I started that off with a um, blog I started called the um, Brown Moses blog after a Frank Zappa song that I enjoyed uh, watching, uh, listening to rather. Um, and you can see it here, hopefully. And um, this is the blog. It doesn't look like much. I didn't really put much effort into it. It was really just a hobby, just a place to put down ideas. And in fact, this is the first post, which is actually about the phone hacking scandal uh, in the UK back in 2012. But I did that for about two years and there was a major um, 
case I found in 2013, which really kind of brought me to the attention of a lot of people where I had been watching um, videos from Syria that showed all kinds of different weapons and trying to figure out what these weapons were, what weapons did the rebels have, what bombs were being dropped on these people. And I had found things like cluster bombs being used, incendiary munitions, barrel bombs. Um, but what I discovered in early 2013 were videos and photographs shared by rebel groups of new weapons. And I was trying to figure out where these weapons had come from. And I discovered they were from the former Yugoslavia. And in fact, these weapons um, we later discovered working with the New York Times were being smuggled from Saudi Arabia um, to the rebel groups in Syria. And it was the first evidence that this was actually happening. And it was all discovered because I had been watching lots of YouTube videos coming from Syria and trying to figure out what everyone had. So that brought me to uh, you know, a greater amount of attention in early 2013. I did a lot more than on chemical weapons attacks and kind of built my reputation on my really terrible looking blog. And then eventually um, I decided I needed something a bit more professional looking and I launched Bellingcat. Um, the idea there was we'd not only have articles using open source investigation, but also resources for people to use. And at that point, Bellingcat was basically 60,000 pounds in crowdfunding, me as the kind of only person really running things, and um, a bunch of volunteers. And the first case we actually ended up investigating was the downing of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, because Bellingcat was launched on July 14th, 2014. And three days later, that's when MX-17 was shot down. So um, one of the first things we did is look at the videos and photographs, which you can see here of the missile launcher, and figured out exactly where these photographs were taken in the eastern Ukraine. And then using other details, such as the shadows being cast as a kind of um, a sun uh, uh, timer, uh, is, is we managed to figure out exactly the time these photographs were taken in many cases. Also, people posting on social media saying, I've just seen a missile launcher drive through my street at the same time that the photograph seems to have been taken. So we could build this timeline and it show where these missile, this missile launcher was being transported to. But we also started coming across videos from elsewhere. And when I say we, I mean basically just a bunch of people on the internet having a chat about what was happening and digging through YouTube videos. And we discovered a lot of videos of a book missile launcher convoy in Russia, which we also tracked. Um, and we could see it was traveling from the city of Kursk down to the border. And these are various locations where it was cited. All social media posts made by Russians on a variety of social media platforms that were discovered. And what we discovered is one of these missile launchers had markings on the side of the missile launcher and damage. Uh, and this is just a representation of some of it that was identical to the one that was seen in eastern Ukraine on the day MH17 was shot down. And by carefully e examining these details between that Russian missile launcher and the one in July, um, 17th, we realized it was the same missile launcher, that this was the missile launcher from Russia that shot down MH17. So that was one of the first kind of big investigations. And that really made um, Bellingcat's name, especially in the Netherlands, where there were, of course, a lot of victims. But the story that really made our name in the UK was the Scripple assassination, because these two guys went on to Russia today and started saying how they were sports nutrition salesmen. But what we discovered is they were not sports nutrition salesmen. They were, in fact, GRU agents and uh, working for the foreign intelligence services of Russia. And the way we figure that out is um, basically through a massive amount of information that had been leaking from the Russian system. For years, there had been databases being sold in Russian markets from the government of house registrations, car registrations. Um, There's also a, a, basically a black market online for information as well that could get you anything, passport details, phone records. And we use that to great extent. We actually discovered these people were serving GRU officers by piecing this information together. But then that opened up a whole new wave of investigation for us because we discovered that these, the same unit of GRU officers had been involved with the poisoning of a Bulgarian arms dealer a few years earlier, Median Gebrev. At the time, the authorities said he was basically having a bad case of food poisoning. But we, what we discovered is a GRU team working with the same unit had been watching him just before he had been poisoned. And in fact, after that was revealed, CCTV footage, which you can see here from the day of the poisoning, showing a very mysterious figure in a parking garage walking up to a car which he was then um, uh, went to the side of, disappeared for a minute or two, and then he came out from the other side um, and looks back at the car to see what had happened. And we believe this is actually the moment when the car was poisoned by the assassination team. And in fact, um, it seems extremely likely now based off our research that uh, there will be kind of more work done on this when Bulgaria is trying to ignore this entire case. But we discovered looking at the phone records of these guys that they've been phoning up um, people who worked here. And this is a laboratory in Russia. And it, funnily enough, makes uh, sports nutrition. 
And we discovered that the scientists who work there are not sports nutrition specialists, but specialists in Novichok, the poison that was used in the uh, Scripple assassination and likely the same one that was used in the uh, Gebrev poisoning. And um, we discovered this by examining phone records very carefully, looking into the individuals. And we discovered that what has actually happened when the Novichok program had been shut down in Russia when they joined the Chemical Weapons Convention is the scientists who worked on that had moved to facilities like this, where they were supposedly working on things like sports nutrition, but they were also talking to assassination squads just before they poisoned people. I don't think that was about sports nutrition. So we discovered this, and of course, then we have the Navani assassination tape, and we can see him in a coma as he's being transported to Berlin. So in August 2020, the opposition leader Navani fell extremely ill on a flight, um, and then eventually fell into a coma, and then he was transported to Berlin. We started looking into this, and the first place we started looking is the phone records of those same scientists. And we discovered they'd actually been phoning up a lot of FSB officers just before the poisoning. And we looked into these FSB officers, which you can see here, and we discovered that, in fact, um, they had travel records we were able to access, phone records we were able to access, that showed that they had followed Navalny not only on that day, but on 40 other occasions. And we were able to show just this is a sample of the data where the white lines of Navalny traveling and the multicolored lines are when people travel to where he is. Right. But on nearly every trip where he stayed overnight, um, Navalny would actually be followed by members of this team, including this set of trips, which was the time he was poisoned. Not only did we have all this flight data co collected, we also had uh, the uh, data of where all the cell phones had been connecting of some of these individuals, which included one person whose cell phone had connected to a cell phone tower just six minutes drive away from his hotel on the day he had actually um, been poisoned. So we had lots of kind of information like this, and we show that Navalny was um, poisoned by this team. It helped that when Navalny foot called up on the suspects, that the suspect gave a 50 minute confession after being convinced that Navalny was actually one of his boss's, boss's assistants, um, which was a very um, interesting moment for us as an investigation team. But we kept digging into these uh, FSFSB team who was responsible for this attempted assassination. And we've discovered three more successful assassinations. Uh, on the left, we have a Russian opposition figure who is part of the official Russian opposition and, and two activists in the Caucasus regions who were, were quite minor individuals, which surprised us. It wasn't just about big figures like Navalny. We've also discovered Vladimir Karamurza, who was a big opposition figure who is friends with Boris Nemstov and worked in the US in the Magnitsky Act, um, Act for the US, was actually involved uh, or was actually poisoned twice by the same team who followed him. He then missed mysteriously fell into a coma and was then flown out to the US for treatment. So what we kind of have actually discovered starting with that Scripple assassination um, case is um, basically a Russian assassination program at home and abroad using an illegal nerve agent factory. Um, and that's Bellingcat. Thank you. Wow. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Elliot, thank you so very much. And thank you to all, everybody for such great contributions to that. Um, I have many, many questions and not a huge amount of time. And I, so I'll just ask a couple. I mean, one is that you've all put extremely glaring and clear cases in front of the public, and yet not a lot happens. I mean, in different ways. I mean, Amelia, starting with you, I mean, we know this Windrush stuff now. And yet, you know, at the end of your talk, you said, still dragging the heels, still not doing anything. It's as though people don't take new responsibility or any sense of blame or care. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, in a way it's quite a motivating um, phenomenon because you can't just kind of bask in the feeling that um, people have listened and apologized and everything will be changed. Actually, um, kind of, you know, upsetting as it is that the um, issues remain so acute three years on, it just requires, um, consistent um, media scrutiny, I suppose, because what I've seen over the past three years is that none of the apologies and none of the action and none of the kind of actually quite positive things that have happened, happened spontaneously. They all happened immediately in response to something very, very embarrassing or the threat of something very embarrassing being, being published in, in a paper. Yes, that, that's a question that we've actually got here from someone called Hannah Marquette about, you know, what what has happened to well, someone falling on their sword or, or accepting a sense of blame for something. I mean, like, coming around to Peter, it makes one wonder what, you know, Matt Hancock only got got because he was got, 
and forced to be found guilty. Will it make any difference? I think there is a general, I think we do have a problem. It's like, it is the Nolan principle problem. Like, and I think Lord Evans was right when he talked about where are we living in a post Nolan age? Because, you know, if fundamental things like transparency stop happening, you know, if whether that's publishing government contracts or, you know, like it is quite remarkable that nobody's resigned from government, the minister has not resigned from government in about a year, considering, you know, Prishi Patel was found to have been bullying her members of staff. We had Gavin, you know, Gavin Williamson has presided over a series of, you know, like debacles at education. We know, you know, there's in a series of, you know, like quite high profile things that I think it's in the past probably would have led, led to ministerial resignations. And it's hard not to see it in government at the moment as well. We have the, a prime minister who's really shown absolute disregard time and again for the norms and standards of, of our parliamentary democracy. So things like, you know, I, I do think it's really important. I think, you know, the things that we have that are supposed to be regulating aspects of democracy just don't really work very well. Like my book talks a lot about that aspect of the world. You know, the maximum fine for breaking electoral law is £20,000. That really is small change. People will tell you it's the cost of doing business. You know, and I think time and again, you see that. You know, ministers who go on to say work in other jobs, uh, go into other jobs and are found, even if they do break the terms in which just you know, and lobby government, they don't even get a slap on the wrist. They just get a letter saying, please don't do that again. And I think there really is a huge problem because if you live in a world in which things become increasingly kind of culture warified and increasingly tribal, those sort of things like transparency and openness and the importance of that starts to become, you know, and you have governments who aren't, you know, governments can go, oh, actually, do you know what? We don't really have to, we don't have to obey. Yeah anymore and I think that's really worrying. How was your Elliot your relationship with the British government when you found out the Salisbury poisoners I mean what what is the kind of way that Bellingcat because so much of what you do is not here but we are responsible for lots of things that you also look into. Yeah I mean um, I mean not so much from the government but there were of course MPs who were quite happy that we had figured out who actually uh, did it and you know supported our work and did promote it a lot. Um, at the same time, though, I mean, we did reveal that, you know, not just the Scripple poisoners were GRU officers, but they'd been involved in other poisonings, this whole chemical weapons program. And we're kind of waiting for something to happen, something that's not just dispelling, you know, getting rid of diplomats or some kind of lame sanctions. Because if we reveal all this information and we've, we've got more to reveal in the future as well, and there's no actual international response that Russia cares about, then they'll see it as a green light to keep on doing this. If all they have is a few sanctions and a few diplomats expelled, then, you know, it's out there that they're murdering mm. people and they might as well keep going because no one's going to stop them doing it. It's as clear as day if there aren't any serious reactions to this. So, um, you know, for us, um, you know, when we talk about whether or not there's a reaction, I mean, for us, it could be life or death, not just for future victims, but maybe even for ourselves, because obviously we've put ourselves on the you know, radar of Russia by writing about their secret assassination program. And we know they work internationally. So that is a bit, um, it does make you a bit nervous. Yeah, I'll bet. I mean, yeah, I can see that it would make you really nervous. But I think it is a really important thing you said. And it's the same thing in a way, you know, with Amelia's, uh, the people who Amelia was writing about, they were powerless, the people that the Home Office were targeting. And they also, the Home Office kind of knew that they weren't all going to get together and they could just victimize these people. So there is a sense that we don't, we don't make any sort of, there's no punishment for this stuff, but a lot of questions coming in, something I'm really interested in is the whole thing of, you know, open source journalism and what you can believe. I mean, we started out this thing about talking about trying to get to the truth and how difficult it is. And the internet looked like it would tell you everything, but in fact, I mean, you, you get yourself into compromising positions, don't you, Elliot? I mean, you write about it in We Are Bellingcat, that every so often you have to get some information from people who seem a tad dodgy. Well, when we were working on the um, cases to do with the poisonings, we had to use this kind of um, uh, uh, Russian uh, kind of black market, of data market, basically. Um, and those people are usually selling. I mean, this is stuff is being sold all over the place in Russia. And it's usually for people who might be wanting to commit insurance fraud or, uh, you know, find out where their you know, partners have been going. So they get their phone records so they can check where they've, who they've been phoning up. 
Um, I mean, we've certainly found a lot of um, GRU officers with wives and girlfriends when we can do this investigation. Um, but, you know, when we're doing that kind of work, we, um, because it isn't like open source material in the traditional sense where you can go and watch a video of something happening and we can explain how we figured it out, we'll use multiple um, sources for like each piece mm -hmm. of data rather than just relying on one source and cross-reference them. Um, in fact, when we actually published our investigation into Navalny, we did a long uh, piece explaining exactly how we'd found this data. And and Russian news sites actually went and found the same data using similar services and compared it to what we had to make sure, you know, we were telling the truth and we weren't, weren't getting it from MI6 or the CIA. And they all were like saying, yeah, this is, you know, we can find this stuff quite easily. You just go and find, you know, the web forum where they're selling some of this stuff. And it's really surprising just how available this information is. And really it's, um, you know, to, it, some people say, well, aren't you worried if that source gets shut down? I say, well, if it gets shut down, it's probably quite good for Russian society that all their stuff isn't freely available to anyone who wants to buy it. So, right. you know, this good and bad with it. Okay. So we've got a question in here from Oliver Bullo, which is really nice. Hello, Oliver. Um, he's, um, he's wondering whether Peter and Amelia, and I'll start with you, Amelia, are jealous of the kind of information that Elliot's team can obtain in Russia and or alarmed by how much of it's actually for sale and how far corruption can go. I mean, I suppose I think when I think of you, Amelia, I think oh, nobody's trying to sell you anything, you're just digging, but presumably even you get put into some tricky situations. Well, I, I would love to know um, how, you know, using Bellingcat's um, approach, we could have turbocharged this whole investigation and perhaps made it more efficient or, you know, um, managed to secure the resignation of, of not just the Home Secretary, but also the Prime Minister. I, I, I don't know, I'd be really interested, but um, I, I think as, as well as talking to the people affected, um, one of the core um, ways that this bit of, of investigation really worked was whistleblowers coming forward yeah. and they um, came forward in lots of, of different ways um, and were incredibly brave and, in, 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 you know, put their jobs on the line and were very, very helpful. But again, you know, that that feels, um, listening to Elliot, it feels quite kind of 19th century <laughs> style journalism. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, Peter, how do you react to that? Yes, it is quite remarkable. You know, I have this image. You are, you know, it's you are kind of wanting to get as much information as you can. The idea of being able to go and buy it, I think it's, I think it's really good as well that Elliot talks about this and, and you know, the kind of journalistically as well. It's very interesting as well because eth it does work, raise interesting kind of ethical questions around journalism. How do you access information? What's legitimate? What's not? I think it's a really good thing to talk about. But part of me is really envious too. Like I can see the social downside of this for sure. And I can see if I lived in Russia, I might prefer if my details were not for sale on the internet. But journalistically, it is, I, you know, I, I, I would behove any journalist who would not want to be able to get this kind of information, especially when you're talking about the kind of issues where he is talking about. We're not talking about the kind of things we're happening with phone hacking scandal, which was, mm. which was something, you know, not the same thing in Britain at all, but where you're trying to actually talk about serious wrongdoing by a state and being able to prove it and show it because that's what's so important as well and I think that's where like the work always has to be able to show compre like, comprehensively that this is what's going on because otherwise it's very easy to batter it down. So when I was reading especially your, your last chapter having just read Bellingcat you know I kept thinking so over the cronyism over Covid for instance would Elliot have been able to take all these different things online, whether it was sort of CCTV of two people, well, they wouldn't have been meeting in a restaurant because it's COVID, but in some ways been able to piece together a home story, sort of in the way that you tracked down the uh, the gun launcher for the uh, for the MH17. Could, could you put it to work on something different? I, mean, I think Amelia makes a really good point because you could have tracked where people were. You might have been able to track back to the fact that they were here when they were six. I mean, it's, it's possible. I mean, so the thing with open source investigation, when we publish stuff, you see the things that actually work. And there's plenty of stuff that doesn't actually work. It kind of falls by the wayside. Um, and it, it could be, I mean, I've been really surprised at what's been really successful in our investigations. Sometimes we do stuff that I think will have no chance of working whatsoever. And we find a huge amount of information. And sometimes you think this will be easy and then we just get completely stuck. So 
th that's why I think when we go and train people and show them how to use this skill, you can combine this with the work you're already doing if you learn how to do this stuff. This is a new set of investigative tools and methodologies that anyone can use in their own work, not just journalists, but in a whole mm -hmm. range of different fields. And that's why for Banning Cat, training and sharing this stuff and bringing people into our kind of network as well, as well because collaboration is so important, is you know, a really big part of what we're doing now. And how do you... Um... I mean, what do you do about things like um, Reddit and QAnon and the kind of conspiracy theories, which affect all of us at the moment? I mean, anti-COVID ones and things like that. I, for me, I think there's, um, because there's a decreasing amount of uh, trust in traditional sources of authority, such as the media and, um, you know, um, uh, government in particular, um, people are looking for alternative sources of authority online. And if, they're, if they want an alternative view on, say, conflict, like the conflict in Syria, they'll find a community online who believes that. But an element of that community are uh, push basically what are conspiracy theories about what's happening in Syria. They're saying there's no chemical weapons attacks, the, Al you know, the white helmets are all Al-Qaeda faking you know all these incidents they're filming those kind of things and there's really no difference from those people than the QAnon people the people who think the earth is flat they've been kind of in a sense radicalized online by finding mm -hmm. communities that reinforce their beliefs and they end up in these bubbles detached from reality but why are we not giving people an alternative th to that why is it if you're looking for an alternative source of authority online most of the places you find are those kinds of places so at Bellingcamp what I really would like to do is start you know working with you know people who are like 16 to 18 teaching them how to do open source investigation uh, I was very inspired actually recently when I saw this project called Student View where students were being trained how to do journalism and I could see how that could be part of this kind of community because then it's not just about those students in the classroom it's about them being part of a network that connects them to different kinds of people across the world it shows them as well that they don't have to be investigating war crimes in syria they can be investigating you know why the bins aren't being emptied and tying down my road and actually have a local impact and empower that's them really to do something that's really interesting the idea of why my bin isn't being emptied on time but i mean the, the point about being with an organization like the guardian isn't it is that people know what it is and they they take it as as the truth it might be a slightly left-wing truth, but it's the truth. Is, do you feel that, Amelia, that, that's, that these brands are incredibly important to hang on to at the moment? I, well, yes, I think so. But I, what I really think is um, we're so massively helped by our enormous um, online readership. Um, and, and that, I suppose, is, is the key um, 21st century element to, to the reporting we've been able to do, which means that... Um, because we don't have a paywall, we're very, very accessible to people and people are kind of reading and responding in enormous numbers to everything um, that's printed. So I suppose it is that kind of combination of, I mean, I know that we kind of dismissed as the mainstream media as, as if that's a bad word, but, you know, I think probably we take um, pride in, in the um, seal of accuracy that, that goes with that. And so having both that that status and and the huge readership is enormously helpful for investigating and quite hard to build up i presume peter when you start a, an organization like open democracy to give it stature and that people look at it and think that's fine that's by open democracy i can trust that yes indeed you know i, I worked for the body what are we going to call the mainstream media for a good decade before joining open democracy and it was one of the first challenges with our work and 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 it's you actually it's exactly what amelia says too though you have to be as accurate and even more accurate than everybody else and, and ellie would have found this with bellingcat too actually your reputation hangs on the line with almost every line you write and when you're saying something you have to make damn sure it is right because when you don't have the hundreds of years of the guardian behind you you can lose that credibility much much more easily so, so you're it is a bit of a tightrope you're walking on it but it forces you i think to be even more fastidious and accurate in the work that you do and before we go because we're sort of up to time i want to ask you all sort of where you see the future going and you know it seems to me sometimes that you know listening to amelia's sagas and the cronyism that in some ways governments get less caring, more, you know, more obtuse, more difficult to get a handle on, despite all these tools we have of transparency. And so are there new, are there going to be new tricks in the book that we can do? Where do you see things? Where do you see yourself, Elliot, with Bellingcat in five, 10 years time? Well, my hope is that we recognise that society has changed really at a very base level to, you know, becoming a 
fully integrated with the online world. And if we start ignoring that and we think the online world is something that's very different, mm -hmm. we'll keep seeing what's happening on January 6th in Washington, D.C. happen time and time again because we won't really understand the core issues. When policymakers are looking at social media platforms saying, or oh, maybe everyone should have their real identity or maybe we should do this or maybe we should do that, they never understand the problem. They don't understand the core issue that is society has changed and until we address society in the same way that it's kind of in a way evolving we're never going to really solve these issues and i think one way of doing that is you know working to build communities and you know the real world that are focused on this kind of evidence-based investigation and feel empowered to change things in their own communities have you got an example of someone who's actually done an open source investigation on the why their bin isn't being collected i really like that no it's what i've been i want to do an experiment on <laughs> i think you make a good app to collect when your bins have been yeah, it would. and it then would. share the data i think it's a super Tell your council that you're doing it wrong and peter where do you think that we're going when this this kind of i mean you're you're right up against the cold face of investigations all the time with with the story that you're on we get is it going to stop it is it going to ever bring it to account I think that is, you know, there's a kind of dolorousness that's probably cast over this this whole event and that all of us are probably saying we have found this stuff. We want something to change. You go and you put it out there and, and journalistically it has become more difficult it's, and it does kind of eat away at you a little bit, whether you're revealing something like the terrible windrush scandal, poisonings, you know, the kind of work I do in political corruption and transparency and you do go well actually like come on guys, here's the evidence, can we mm. take action on it? And it does, like, you know, without casting into the future, I think it does make it more difficult to do the jobs that we can do. But I do think a large part of that is, like, I think there's audiences out there who want to be almost told how these things work and to be educated into it. And I think that there is a big job of education there about bringing people on. And like, I think Elliot's totally right about accepting the reality of how the world has changed. I don't think it's about going backwards, but I do think there's a great opportunity to show people how the world works now and to kind of almost burst that bit because one of the things I struggle with is, okay, there's lots of mistrust. Am I adding to this mistrust? Does my work just make people even less trustful of institutions? And I think that's a really important kind of, it's not about going, the whole thing is corrupt. It's about going, look, these are things that are wrong and these are the ways we could try and fix them. Yeah, I think that that's really interesting. And I think also in a way what Elliot was saying, Amelia, does kind of chime with what you said about The Guardian, that you're, you, are, you, you do have a proper hybrid life. And I think that thing of taking the web really seriously is really important. Yeah, and, and I also um, I also feel like I struggle a lot with kind of the um, w whether to feel more pessimistic or optimistic. And, I, and actually, I, I really do want to end on a kind of positive, optimistic note, because actually enormous things um, have, have happened as, as a result of the, the kind of investigation that we did around mm. Windrush and it has been incredibly positive and I you know I'm almost kind of nitpicking in the sense that there is still an enormous amount to be done um, you know and I'm still stamping um, stamping and, and kind of scraping away at it and I think that, that the real um, lesson is that it, it is a kind of slow um, grinding slog as as we've all said and you know you just have to kind of keep on going at it and not feel um, disillusioned or, or, or disheartened and just kind of continuing to try and raise these issues. Well thank you that was a great note to end on and I mean thank you all not just for being here but for actually the work you do, the stories that you've cracked, the info that you've put in front of us, and your just sheer brilliance and persistence and Bellingcat and Open Democracy and all Amelia's work in The Guardian, that incredible, the best examples of the best kind of journalism that we so desperately need. So thank you all very much for being with us. And there are three great books out there for you to buy, two there behind me on the shelf and Elliot's book right here. All the details are online. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but I think we covered most of the general things that people wanted to ask. And please join us again. And as I say, I applaud our speakers very deeply and thank you and good night.